Hi guys, my name is Catherine. Thank you for joining me again for another episode of Missing the Missing. In this episode number 17, we're going to be talking about Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez. I do apologise in advance, Spanish is not my first language. I have relied heavily on the use of translators for this one, and I have tried to verify or corroborate information wherever possible. Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez was born on the 1st of January 1976 to his parents, Andres Martinez Navarro and Carmen Gomez Legas. The family lived in a hamlet known as Los Canovas in the district of Fuente Alamo in the south of Spain. It is situated in the dry region of Murcia, which lies in the basin of the Mar Menor, or the small sea is surrounded by mountains. Andres was an experienced truck delivery driver and Juan had a strong relationship with and respect for his parents. He also had a wonderful relationship with his wider maternal family who doted on him. He was a smart boy and a well-behaved child who had made his first Holy Communion and was a very good student, paying attention at school. Juan's father, Andres, had promised to take his son along with him on his next trip to the north of the country if he finished his school year with good grades. Needless to say, Juan worked very hard and achieved high grades, holding his father to the promise he had made. Juan had accompanied his father on some of his previous trips, but had longed to see the greenery of northern Spain, and in particular, the milk cows grazing on the humid Basque pastures that he'd learned about at school. He'd never yet gone as far as the northern climate, which would be a stark contrast to his dry, almost desert-like hometown. Andres had an upcoming work trip to Bilbao, which he felt would be an ideal opportunity to take advantage of and have a short family break. Andres convinced his wife to come along, as she sometimes did, to supervise their son whilst Andres tended to business. It was Tuesday, the 24th of June, 1986, El Dia de San Juan, or the Day of St. John. It is a large festival celebrated throughout Spain from the evening before, which involves a feast and the lighting of bonfires and burning of items to celebrate the birth of the patron, St. John the Baptist, followed by a ritualistic cleansing to grant 12 months of upcoming peace. It was on this day, the trio would take Andres' sister's car and drive to Cartagena, where the only vehicle they owned, Andres truck, a Volvo F12 registration M5383CY and trailer registration MU1587R, was loaded and waiting for them. The journey was the only thing out of the ordinary in the family's routine on the lead up to the disappearance. Andres' assignment was to transport 23,000 litres, or approximately 5,000 gallons, of almost pure 98% strength oleic sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is a colourless and odourless corrosive liquid. It is very flammable and is known to cause immediate chemical burns when in contact with the skin, as well as dehydration. The acid was for industrial use and was to be conveyed from the southern port of Cartagena to a petrochemical company in the northern city of Bilbao, a journey which, by today's standards, should take approximately eight hours and is about 850 kilometres or 530 miles. At the time of his disappearance, Juan was described as a 10-year-old Hispanic male child with black eyes and black hair. His height is recorded as approximately 165 centimetres, or 5 foot 4 inches tall, with his weight being recorded as about 65 kilos, or 10 stone, or 140 pounds. To me, these stats seem a little high, but I have no corroborating information, and these are the details that are printed on Juan's missing persons posters. At 7pm on Tuesday the 24th of June 1986, Juan's dream come true journey commenced. The family had reached Andres' preloaded Volvo F12 tanker truck and set off with the hazardous cargo safely in tow stored in a large tank attached to the truck. According to the official timeline, in the two hour window between 7.01 and 8.58pm, they had travelled 97 kilometres before stopping at Venti del Olivo, a restaurant near Cieza, Murcia. Here they encountered a trucker colleague, Cristobal Paredes, who worked for the same company as Andres Juimicas Meroño. They exchanged pleasantries and all seemed in good order. 
the family ordered coffee and Fanta before continuing the next leg of their journey. From here, the journey is plotted as follows. At 12 minutes past midnight, they stopped on the service road at the Coquense town of Las Pedroneras, where they were seen to nap. The next stop on from here was at the Los Angeles fuel station near Madrid at 3 a.m. Then, at 5.20 to 5.30 a.m., the family stopped again at an inn called the Maison Aragon near Cabanillas. Whilst at the inn, they would be served breakfast by waiter Felipe Alhambra, who remembered the family due to Juan's striking red pants and shirt. They ordered a coffee for Andres, a coffee with milk for Carmen, and a glass of milk and a pastry or cake for Juan. Things seemed to be well at this point. The family paid their bill and left to continue on their journey. At 6am on Wednesday the 25th of June 1986, Andres Volvo F12 truck was making its way downhill through the mountain pass in the direction of Ayrun, along the Segovian side of Somosierra. It was a conventional road, with one lane in each direction. The weather and road conditions were considered ideal, with a dry and clean pavement and sunny weather. Witnesses would claim that the vehicle began to drive erratically, braking, speeding and swerving for no apparent reason. The truck overtakes the vehicle before knocking the wing or side mirror from another as it passes by too close. Then... The truck crashes into the back of yet another truck in front of it, effectively running it off the road. One witness described the ordeal, saying that the truck initially was at a speed of between 15 and 20 kilometers per hour until, unexpectedly, he lost the effectiveness of his braking system, gradually starting to gain speed, reaching 110 kilometers per hour. Finally, at one of the curbs in the road on the approach to kilometre 95 of the N1 National Road, the truck had a powerful head-on collision with an oncoming vehicle. The speed was approximately 120 to 140 kilometres, or 75 to 87 miles per hour. The force of the impact overturns the Volvo F12, making it veer off-road and rupturing its tank. The cistern crushed the vehicle cabin and flooded the entire area with its toxic load, causing small explosions and a toxic cloud to envelop the area. Sadly, the acid also sweeps through the truck's cabin, removing whatever chance of survival Andres and Carmen may have had. In total, there were four trucks involved in the incident outside of the Volvo. Of them, three drivers were uninjured, though one was seriously injured. The Spanish Civil Guard attended at the location and ruled an emergency very quickly. Justice of the Peace Juan Garcia Torres remembered that, quote, we found a huge column of smoke due to the acid's contact with the water. No one dared to approach it, though he did quickly ascertain that there were two fatalities in the cab. It was clear that it was too late to help them. So the focus was then turned to evacuating the scene, diverting traffic and notifying neighbouring provinces. Once those that could be safely evacuated were escorted from the scene, the combined efforts of the Civil Guard and the firefighters turned to neutralising the threat from the hazardous material. It was metres from the nearby Duraton River. The containment of the spread was paramount to prevent contamination of the water and subsequent ecological disaster. The officers worked tirelessly in dangerous conditions, wearing gas masks to protect from the poisonous fumes for three hours. Urgent shipments of £33,000 of lime and sand were brought to the scene to smother the polluted area. It took specialist units more than 10 hours to retrieve the remains from the truck. When they were finally able to recover the bodies, although they had been terribly corroded, Andres, age 36, and Carmen, age 34, were quickly identified. Andres was in the prone position on his chest, half buried. Carmen was in a sitting position, trapped in the cabin and crushed. Carmen's mother, Maria Legas, was contacted and informed of the passing of her daughter and son-in-law. To their surprise and astonishment, she would simply ask, And the boy? Please tell me the boy is all right. As far as the investigators could see, there was no boy in sight. Nearing 9pm, investigators searched the wreckage of the truck for any sign of Juan. They found children's cassette tapes and boys' clothing, confirming that he had indeed been with his parents on the trip. It was speculated that the sulfuric acid, as corrosive as it is, 
could have eroded one's remains to the point of disintegration, though specialist scientific chemical experiments were conducted, which proved otherwise. Tests indicated that a human body, bones and all, would only be completely destroyed after a period of five days, with the soft tissue dissolving after 24 hours, and even then, only when entirely submerged within it. Furthermore, there are elements of human remains which don't react in the same way to the acid. For example, hair, nails, teeth, and various parts of clothing or fabrics which should have been found. The only item that was found was the blue rubber sole of a running shoe or trainer, though the size could not be conclusively matched to Juan, and it therefore could not be ascertained whether it had been in place prior to the crash and was unrelated. Officers brought a crane and an excavator to the scene to lift what was left of the truck to see if, tragically, Juan may have been crushed beneath it. As the vehicle had only two seat belts, Juan would not be wearing one, lending credence to the possibility that he may have been ejected from the truck on impact. It took 30 hours to confirm that Juan was nowhere within the wrecked vehicle. The surrounding area was then searched extensively in an 18-mile or 30-kilometre radius for over a month. They searched with multiple resources, including trained dogs, horses, helicopters, ATVs, and the civil guardsmen on foot. They even searched the river or crevices and ditches, yet there was no sign of one. There were no remains, no trail, nothing that suggested the child's whereabouts or fate. Andre's business was investigated due to information that we will get to later on, but no evidence was found to link him to any criminality or criminal associates. The crash was so severe that during the catastrophe, three neighbouring villages were left without access to water. Civil guards and firefighters suffered injuries from exposure to the toxic acid in the air, yet volunteers joined the police in droves, several thousand of them, to help search for the missing youngster. From students to the military combed the area for days. The sand and lime would be severed, parted, dug up to see if the little one had accidentally been overlooked or mistakenly buried, to no avail. Intelligence was disseminated throughout the neighbouring regions to look out for the boy, but no leads were developed. The truck's tachometer and tachograph were recovered intact, however, revealing some interesting facts about the final minutes on Juan's dream journey. The readings confirmed the stops along the route from Cartagena to Sonasierra as discussed, but revealed further questionable circumstances. The tachograph showed that when the Volvo was ascending the mountain pass, it stopped 12 times in just 23 minutes. The shortest period lasted for less than one second, with the longest duration of the stop being the final one near the highest point being about 22 seconds. Other commuters and truck delivery drivers were questioned, who claimed that they would each make only one stop at the most, describing that two would be unnecessary and therefore a waste of time. One such transporter was questioned, Joaquim Bermejo Martin, who suggested that in a journey of 30 kilometres, the tachograph seems to indicate that the truck did indeed actually stop rather than stall, noting that the hill has a 12% incline, though the tachograph could have reflected a stop when driving at speeds as low as 10 kilometres per hour. There were no traffic incidents or oil spillages, nothing on this stretch of road at this time which could have accounted for the numerous short stops. Giving the witnesses suspicion of brake failure, the truck was thoroughly examined to see what could have caused the incident. Contrary to popular belief, the vehicle showed no signs of damage to the brakes, suggesting that Andres had reached such high speeds deliberately. For those who may be unaware, as I was myself, loosely speaking, a tachograph is a device that records the distance and time travelled by a vehicle, especially a truck or coach, used to track the driver's working time, while the tachometer is a device for measuring the revolutions per minute or RPMS of the revolving shaft as with the drive shaft of a vehicle. But please note that I am not a mechanical or vehicular expert and so cannot attest to the veracity of these notes. Basically, in short, the tachograph records everything and tachometers show the rotation of the engine's crankshaft to provide guidance to the driver in relation to gears, etc. Failure to hear the guidance can, in extreme cases, result in engine failure. 
The reason I wanted to understand this was to ascertain whether it was possible for one or the other to register a stop when the vehicle is in fact still moving. An example I read explains that if your car is at a complete stop, your speedometer should read zero, but your tachometer should not be at zero unless you've turned your engine off either on purpose or stalled it by accident. If the car is stopped and the engine is still running, you should usually see that the tachometer reads a value above zero but under 1000 RPM. Tachographs, however, they can malfunction or be manipulated in various ways. For example, twisting the marker, blocking the arm, short circuiting the unit, or even using a magnet or interrupting the power supply amongst others. I take this to mean that whilst the information garnered from the tachograph could be accurate, it is just as plausible, given the circumstances, that it may have malfunctioned. One trucker who had been forced off the road stated that he had seen a white Nissan Veneta in the immediate aftermath, which stopped near to his vehicle. The driver was described as a tall, moustached man, with the passenger being a blonde female. The man approached and spoke with a foreign accent, advising not to worry and explaining that his wife was a nurse. The female went on to briefly inspect his injuries before leaving to check on the Volvo. In varying reports, people who have been described as shepherds, cattle herders and a pastor allegedly came forward to claim that they had each seen the same white van, along with a seemingly unrelated elderly female who quickly left the scene. They advised that the white van stopped near to the Volvo in the minutes after the incident. There have been conflicting accounts as to the couple's nationality, with varying sources pointing towards them being French, others suggesting German, and yet others still indicating that they were Nordic. Additionally, it is claimed that at least the female had been dressed in a white doctor's robe. The pair was said to have been scanning the wreckage and to have removed a package or a bundle from the truck's cabin. There is no further information as to the size of what was recovered from the wreckage or the shape. Unfortunately, nobody had recorded the vehicle registration marker and after more than 3,000 white Nissan Venet vans were investigated, the investigation was no further along and police were unable to trace these witnesses to corroborate their statements. Interestingly, whilst the majority of truckers would have a CB radio, there was no mention made as to whether or not Andres had one. Um, CB radios have been legal to use in Spain since 1983, but if Andres had one, he did not use it to signal for help. A few days after the incident, a delivery man named uh, Dionisio Jimenez filed a report with the police regarding a potential sighting of Juan. He thought that he'd seen him near to the Abandos Bilbao train station near to where he worked. The investigation failed to uncover any new information and the sighting was not able to be substantiated. Juan's family distributed 85,000 posters with Juan's picture on them, on streets, in schools, town halls and post offices, hoping that somebody would call with more information. They hired a private investigator who was renowned as a missing person specialist. In total, they spent a considerable amount of money on the search, but sadly, no leads led to Juan. Relatives were frustrated at the initial investigation, with Juan's maternal uncle, Juan Garcia Legaz, claiming that there were two vital first years with very little attention to help us in our search. Though it does sound like the search was very extensive. Just 20 days after the incident, on the 14th of July of 1986, the last independent witness to see Juan before he vanished, Felipe Alambro, the waiter at the Aragon Inn, tragically died in a traffic accident on the same road. In May of 1987, a driving school instructor reported to the police that he had met Juan in downtown Madrid under bizarre circumstances. He stated that a foreign, elderly, blind woman entered his business asking for directions for the American embassy. According to his report, the woman claimed that her family had escaped from Iran six months prior and that they were living off charity, getting their food from the Red Cross. He alleged that the woman was guided by a boy aged about 10 or 11 that spoke Spanish with an Andalusian accent and who seemed confused or disorientated. When he asked about the boy, the woman changed the subject. When he complimented the boy's Spanish, the woman got nervous and wouldn't explain how he came to know the language so well. 
it was only later when he saw the photograph on television that the teacher would recognise the boy as Juan. Interestingly, some of the original witnesses to the incident mentioned an elderly lady who quickly fled the scene. There are a couple of issues with this account though, primarily being that Juan was not Andalusian and while similar, his local accent has some differences to that of Andalusia. The man claimed to visit the Red Cross on several occasions, but he never saw the pair again. Neither the police nor Juan's remaining relatives believe this account, and the police were unfortunately unable to locate either of the two for questioning. The same year, 1987, it was printed in the El País National newspaper that heroin had been found in the cistern of the truck after further inspection. Allegedly, the civil guard found a white canvas in a hidden compartment in the trailer which contained a stash of about a kilogram or two pounds of heroin. It was described as being surrounded by acid, both above and below. Rumours spread that Andres was involved in drug smuggling, but it appears that this was later disproved with the help of a private investigator. Whilst the initial examination of the substance tested positive for heroin, it was later resubmitted to the National Institute of Toxicology for a more in-depth analysis. The result was negative this time. Either way, it is unclear how this came to be in the trailer or whether or not Andres was aware of its presence. The owner of the vat didn't believe that Andres had anything to do with drugs or contraband. On the 23rd of April 1992, the Spanish TV show on missing persons at Quien Sabe Donde, or Who Knows Where, featured an episode on Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez, named El Niño de Somasierra. Twelve years after the incident, the Civil Guard and the University of Granada launched the Phoenix Programme, designed to assist in the genetic identification of missing persons by way of DNA comparison. As part of the programme, the Civil Guard periodically compare the genetic profiles of relatives of the missing in a cold or unsolved case reviews. In 2008, voluntary DNA samples were taken from Maria Legas, Juan's maternal grandmother. 25 years after the original disappearance, the Spanish programme Rastreadores released a special segment about the case called Somos Sierra, 25 Años de Silencio, 25 Years of Silence. In 2015, the Phoenix programme detected similarities between Maria Legas DNA and that of human remains found in Guadalajara. After further investigation, it was decided that there were not enough similarities for this to be a confirmed match and the lead fizzled out. In June of the same year though, 2015, researchers wanted to compare DNA from Juan's parents with the aforementioned remains to see if a conclusive match could be made. The request to exhume the bodies of Andres and Carmen to extract DNA samples for the purpose of building a complete genetic profile was brought before the investigating court number one of Colmenar Viejo, Madrid. The court was not supportive, given the time that had elapsed, though later investigators would re-attend at court with signed consent from three of Juan's uncles from both maternal and paternal family branches. But sadly, the motion was again denied in September of 2015, and the line of inquiry has therefore been stalled. There is no further information that has been released at this time in respect of the remains. There are a few theories as to what could have happened to Juan. The biggest theory appears to be that, tragically, one was injured or killed in the accident and his remains were subsequently disintegrated by the sulfuric acid. Earlier on in the episode, we discussed the fact that scientific chemical experiments had been conducted. Um, these were with human and animal remains and proved that the remains could not have been dissolved completely in the circumstances. There was not enough acid in the cab to have completely submerged one and he would not have been exposed to it for as long as would be required to do so. Even if Juan had been ejected from the truck at the time of the impact, and had potentially landed in a ditch which filled with acid, there should have been remnants left behind to indicate this. For example, as we've said, hairs, teeth, nails and fibres, etc. Tests showed that it would take 24 hours before the soft tissue was lost, and up to five days before the bones were seriously damaged. Another pertinent point to note is that, whilst damaged, the bodies of Andres and Carmen were recognisable when recovered, without having to resort to DNA or, or dental forensic analysis. 
it would therefore be appropriate to assume the same should be the case for Juan. Some people have suggested that it would take less time for a child's body to dissipate than for an adult. And while this may make some sense, if the height and weight details on Juan's missing person posters are accurate, then Juan would be closer to the size of a young adult rather than a 10-year-old boy. Going back to the possibility that Juan was ejected from the vehicle due to the impact of the crash, remember he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, we could also consider the prospect that Juan, whilst injured or burning from the acid, was able to walk from the scene. He may have walked to the Duraton River if he felt it would soothe his burns and was perhaps then swept away, though the river has been described as more of a stream and it was searched but to an unknown degree. Equally, Juan had never been to the area and may not have seen the river at all. Despite it being just 20 metres from the roadside, it was behind a slim lining of trees, albeit he may have been able to hear the rushing water. Wandering around in a dazed and confused injured state, he may also have fallen into a ditch or a hole and sadly succumb to his injuries out of sight. Apparently, illegal well drilling is a big problem in Spain due to various reasons and people have been known to fall in. Some wells can be up to 250 feet deep. One Reddit user stated that there was a recent case in the state where a woman went missing after leaving work early. Search parties looked for her, but they couldn't find her. But they recently found her skeletal remains in the same area they searched, and they don't believe that any foul play was involved. In this case, though, the search was both intensive and extensive, so I like to think that he would have been recovered if so. Furthermore, the child would have had to leave the scene unnoticed by a minimum of four witnesses and potentially a further three to five when considering the couple, the shepherds and the elderly lady. Equally, experts believe that it would be unlikely for a child to have survived a crash of such magnitude. In fact, post-mortems would show that, perhaps mercifully, Andres and Carmen were likely to have died on impact and therefore before the acid could cause them any further harm. So let's move on to consider another prevalent theory. We know there were witness sightings at the time that place a couple at the scene and that the female was allegedly a nurse. The last time they were seen was apparently after pulling up alongside the Volvo and carrying a large item of some description away. Some have proposed that said item was in fact one wrapped in a blanket. So were the couple genuine Good Samaritans? Had they witnessed the accident and felt a desperate need to help? We know that the female briefly checked over another truck driver's wounds, so this seems plausible enough. Perhaps they wrapped the child in a blanket and carried him away, intending to seek medical attention for him. It is theorised that Juan may have passed away from his injuries prior to receiving the aid. If this was legitimately the case, however, then why would the couple not come forward? or continued to take the child to a hospital or place of safety, even if he was deceased. It's possible that they may have been involved in criminality or may have been illegally in the country, and maybe this is why they didn't come forward. But why did they not call for assistance or leave the child somewhere safe and in sight? Are we to believe that people as seemingly good natures as these with seemingly pure and innocent intentions would be so crass as to dispose of the child? It doesn't seem plausible for such disparate behaviours to be demonstrated by the same pair. The captain of the Spanish Civil Guard, Juan Manuel Sanchez, agrees that this is the most logical theory. He goes on to say that years later he read on the internet that, quote, There is no mystery with the child of Somosierra. The son of Somosierra was picked up and tried to take him to a hospital with pure intentions, but he died on the spot. No further information has been released in this respect, and it is unknown whether the lead was followed. Either way, no evidence has su surfaced to substantiate or contradict the account. There is also the possibility that the child did survive, but knowing that his parents were deceased, perhaps the couple took it upon themselves to raise the boy as their own. If the suspicions about their nationality are correct, then it is conceivable that they may have removed him to their country of origin. We don't know how badly injured one would have been at the time, though experts suggest greatly so. He may have had no memory of his prior life, which may explain why he's not come forward in the subsequent years. 
he may have no knowledge of the truth of his past. Maybe the couple even euthanized the child in an act of alleged mercy or pity. If the nurse didn't believe that the child could make a full or meaningful recovery, then rather than leaving him in pain, they may have made the decision in their minds to put him out of his misery. This is a drastic supposition and clearly speculative. But if they decided to kill the boy, then they would know that evidence would attest to that fact, despite the acid corrosion. And maybe this could explain why they removed him from the scene, perhaps hoping that officials would assume that all traces of Juan was lost to the acid. Of course, there are alternative theories that have arisen regarding the couple's attendance at the scene. So then let's consider a second most sinister reason for their presence and actions. This suggests that the couple either changing their mind once one was under their control, or even with the explicit intent to do so, they removed one into some form of trafficking. Whilst the knowledge of the problem was limited in the 1980s, certainly the offence itself was as prevalent then as it always has been. The couple may have seen an opportunity and could have sold the boy for whatever purpose. We know that Sexual exploitation is as rife in recent times as historic, but there is another form of trafficking that is, to some, even more terrifying. Organ trafficking. Infuriatingly, this is the practice of trafficking people in order to illegally harvest their organs to sell on the black or red market. This abhorrent practice is far more common than we'd like to believe. Though in modern times, there has been legislation brought out to combat the issue and bring perpetrators to justice. The Global Financial Integrity, or GFI, stated in their 2017 Transnational Crime Report that illicitly acquired organs are involved in up to 10% of all transplants, but organ trafficking generates about $840 million to $1.7 billion annually. Transplants in Spain have been traced as far back as 1965, with legislation approved in 1979. After this, transplant activity using cadaveric organs increased progressively during the 1980s. The peak came in 1986, though numbers then dwindled by 20% during the rest of the decade, leading to exponential growth on the waiting lists. This would have led to astronomical demand for unlawful transplants, which in turn would need donors, in these cases, involuntary. However, in 1989, Dr. Matheson's took over the new National Transplant Organization amid protests in respect of the waiting lists, and in just three years, Spain became the world leader in donations and life-saving operations, where it has stayed ever since. It is bad enough that there is a so-called market for this type of thing, but to make matters even worse, it is known that children have fallen victims to this heinous practice, being easier targets due to their vulnerability. I won't dwell on this subject because it is quite horrifying, but many of the alternatives aren't much better. On a brighter note though, some of the theories that involve one being removed from the scene are given more weight by subsequent reported sightings, including the one at the train station in Bilbao a few days later, and the one from the driving instructor who claimed he had seen Juan with the Iranian woman. To its merit, Juan's remaining relatives firmly believe that he is alive. After finding the alleged drugs in the system the following year, many people have subscribed to the theory that Andres may have been involved in criminality, in particular drug transportation, and that Juan had been kidnapped for some reason. Firstly, we know that Juan was present. Items attributed to him were found in the truck, and he was seen by others just 30 minutes to an hour prior. However, there was no evidence to suggest he was in the Volvo at the time of the collision. In fact, Justice of the Peace Juan Garcia Torres openly explained that the question of Juan's presence in the vehicle at that time was asked, even doubted. The erratic driving and the plentiful stops in the final minutes, for some, support this idea. They posit that Juan was removed from the truck during the 20-second stop on the road, and that this was what prompted Andres to speed up and ultimately to crash. We've mentioned that there were people present at the time who could have removed the boy, but who have not been located since. The confusing factor is, though, that while the initial test resulted positive, furthermore comprehensive testing showed that the substance was not heroin. 
I'm not sure if it was another illicit substance. It certainly is an unusual place for it to have been located or hidden. But why would someone kidnap the child? As a warning, maybe, or a recompense for something? Maybe to ensure a certain act was done or not done? Juan's uncle, Juan Garcia Lagas, told Millennial 3 in an interview that he believes some other vehicle was blocking the truck as it ascended the pass in order to force Andres to stop and that the child was kidnapped in the last stop with the 22nd duration. Quote, at the last stop, the longest, the 22 second stop, there was time for the boy to do something, take him away. Juan Manuel Sanchez, a captain of the Civil Guard and a chief of search operations, considers the possibility that Juanita was taken from the vehicle as an explanation for Andres' erratic driving. It was also reported, though not substantiated, that during their investigation into the disappearance of Juanito, the family began receiving telephone threats from a criminal network. Juan Garcia Legaz was quoted, though again unverified, as saying that they knew that as long as they did not release their prey, there were no witnesses who could denounce them. We asked for the intervention of our telephones. No help. Another Reddit user offers the following hypothesis. Allegedly, there was a police checkpoint in Summer Sierra that morning, unverified, and that in order to pass it safely, drug runners had forced the truck to stop on the way up and propositioned Andres to carry the drugs for them. A family with a legitimate reason to be transporting loads would raise much less suspicion. If Andres refused, they could have kidnapped Juan to ensure he trafficked the drugs through the checkpoint. In a frenzy, Andres could have driven chaotically, worried for the safety of his son, or in order to deliberately try and draw attention if there was a checkpoint. He could even potentially have been trying to detach the load, either to lighten his vehicle and increase his speed, or if he was in front of the vehicle, to block their way. After the crash, maybe the contraband was removed by the couple. There was allegedly a media article printed stating that Andres' family had said that he'd received threats from supposed mafia for weeks prior to the incident, demanding that he undertake work for them as a drug carrier. But the family later denounced this and no other truckers have made any similar reports. There is such thing, though, as a parasitic load. This is determined to be a load of cargo, usually contraband of some sort, which is attached to or placed in an unsuspecting vehicle without the owner or driver's knowledge. The drugs are then transported and are collected at the other end, again without the, the knowledge of the driver. This may have been what was occurring here, we don't know. Not a perfect theory, but certainly options to consider. However, Given that Summer Sierra is not far from Madrid, the capital of Spain, and the fact that Spain is a big transit country for drugs, it may be more likely that any drugs to be trafficked will be placed in a vehicle heading north to or through France, or heading south um, for onward dissemination by the sea. Equally, Andres was a strange target. The company he worked for, at least today, consists of less than 10 employees. Aside from these questions... How would they feasibly have taken the child if the vehicle was known, due to the tachograph, to have been on the road for the 23 minutes since leading the Aragon Inn and crashing on the mountain pass? We know the question of the stops is bizarre, but it could have been a malfunction. Justice of the Peace Juan Garcia Torres doesn't believe the drugs theory. Nobody who was spoken to believed that Andres was involved in any form of drugs or crime. Though the family's comment, quote, Andres was not voluntarily involved in said business, has led to speculation that they believe that Andres may have been circumstantially forced to be. It was also claimed that Andres was in debt at the time, though I wouldn't want to cast any aspersions on his character, least of all posthumously, so I must also state that Andres was known to be an honest person who worked hard to provide for his family. Another Reddit user offered the anecdotal thoughts on the matter. In short, uh, the user didn't find that number of stops odd. They gave an account of a journey they had made up a pass in California for between 15 and 20 minutes. They explained that some large vehicles didn't stop at all, other trucks once or twice, more for older vehicles. But they claimed they stopped their RV and a trailer 12 times, about once every 30 seconds, sometimes for less than 5 or 10 seconds. Many factors could contribute to the decision to stop, 
and they made a good point that the Volvo could have been slowing to let other vehicles pass. Sticking with the tachograph, perhaps the brakes were faulty. Earlier on, we mentioned that the official stance is that the brakes were fine when checked, though it has actually been reported in some sources that the brakes were found to be faulty or broken. I'm not sure which is correct, but having listened to and read much of the testimony of the officials involved, they have never stated that the brakes were faulty. They have, though, investigated without success the possibility that the brakes may have been sabotaged between the Aragon Inn and the Summer Sierra Pass. If they were, though, perhaps it was recording when Andres hit, hit the brakes and he noticed there was a problem, which could explain the erratic driving behaviour. Some of the other truckers involved stated that they believed it was evident that Andres was experiencing brake failure. Whilst Andres was an experienced driver, he had apparently only recently purchased the truck. If not, it is a very reckless thing to do to speed up on a mountain pass or drive erratically with over 5,000 gallons of fuming sulfuric acid in tow. Unless, for some reason, he intended to harm his family in a murder-suicide scheme, but this doesn't make any sense. They were on their way for a family holiday and by all accounts there was nothing to suggest that any of the family would harm each other. An alternative thought is that one of the occupants of the Volvo experienced an issue which led to the strange behaviour. Perhaps Juan choked on a snack and Andres decided to speed up, worrying to get to a place of safety to help him, given that there were four other trucks in the immediate vicinity at the time. Maybe Andres could have suddenly become ill, interfering with his ability to control the vehicle. He may have had a stroke or a heart attack. There could have been a domestic disagreement between Andres and Carmen. If Andres had taken his eye off the road or hand off the steering wheel, the crash could have occurred. Given the model of the truck, a Volvo F12, it does appear that the load was completely external and attached to a trailer. This would reduce, if not negate, the risk of sulfuric acid poisoning as there should be no way for the fumes to make their way into the truck cabin. However, if for some reason it was possible, breathing small droplets of sulfuric acid at levels that might be in the air can cause breathing difficulties, being more likely to occur in children than adults. When inhaled, the signs and symptoms may include coughing, coughing up blood, choking, chest heaviness or pain, reduced blood pressure, hypertension, headache, weakness, and poten potentially collapse. We could seriously go on forever discussing these theories. Did somebody deliberately cause the accident, hoping that the acid would cover up a crime? Were they alone in the vehicle, or had they picked up a hitchhiker? And of course, the classic theory that I've never addressed before, that Juanito was abducted, all right, by aliens. Miguel Pedrero, author of El Universo No Es Plano, or The Universe Is Not Flat, suggests that the way the couple was described by eyewitnesses is common with many cases of close encounters with UFOs. Allegedly tall Nordic is a common term used to describe aliens that look Scandinavian. It is easy to see now why Interpol described this case as the strangest missing persons case in Europe. Sadly, we may never know what truly happened to Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez on that fateful morning of the 25th of June, 1986, in the Summer Sierra Pass. In this section, I'd like to draw your attention to a brilliant organisation committed to eradicating human trafficking, Destiny Rescue, reading from their website. Destiny Rescue is an internationally recognised Christian non-profit organisation dedicated to rescuing children trapped in exploitation and the sex trade. Our vision is to rescue the sexually exploited and enslaved, restore the abused, protect the vulnerable, empower the poor and be a voice for those who can't speak up for themselves. We currently work in seven countries around the world and have celebrated over 4,000 lives rescued from the evils of sexual exploitation. Destiny Rescue has operations in Thailand, Cambodia, the Dominican Republic, the Philippines, India, and other locations that remain undisclosed for security purposes. We also have offices in three donor nations, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Since 2011, we've been working tirelessly to free children from exploitation around the world. 
We have helped keep hundreds more from entering the sex trade through our various prevention programmes, ensured justice for those who have been wronged, and raised awareness to untold numbers. We will continue to expand to reach even more children in the days ahead. This is a wonderful organisation with a worthy cause and working towards an incredible aim. I wish them every success in all of their future endeavours. I'm going to leave you again with the description of what Juan looked like at the time, as well as some final words from the investigators. At the time of his disappearance, Juan was described as a 10-year-old Hispanic male child with black eyes and black hair. If seen today, Juan would be 44 years old. His height was, at the time, recorded as approximately 165 centimetres, or 5 foot 4 inches tall with his weight being recorded as about 65 kilos, 10 stone, or 140 pounds. Justice of the Peace Juan Garcia Torres sums things up quite nicely when he says that hope should never be lost, and despite it waning, there may yet be a possible miracle. Possibly, he says, someone may appear who can clarify things. In the family's hometown, questions linger. Today, more than ever, they continue to cry over the absence of Juan Pedro without losing hope, waiting for his return. Juan's remaining family believes it's possible that he's still alive, in fact, firmly believe it. Without evidence to the contrary, hope is also still alive. And now, a final heartfelt message from Juan Manuel Sanchez, captain of the Civil Guard. I want to take this moment. I want the camera to look at me and stay on focus, and I want to tell you to the people who committed this crime. Yes, it was a crime. That the statute of limitations may have passed. And because of that, I encourage you to be brave and please say, yes, effectively, this happened. Even if it is anonymously, if only so the family can pick up the remains that probably still exist. So if you have any information relating to the disappearance of Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez, please use the contact details in the description box to pass it on to those in a position to deal with it. So thank you very much for spending some time with me today and for taking the time to hear more about Juan's story. Hopefully everybody I've just mentioned is in the right and there will be a miraculous conclusion to this story. Take care, look after yourselves and each other and I will see you in the next video. Bye.